uh, was primarily on livestock farms. Ever since I got into high school, I spent about every summer working on farms. That also included a year on a dairy farm in Norway. I worked two summers on Amish farms in Lancaster County. And I also hitchhiked my way across the country working on farms of all types and sizes. But again, it was basically row cropping. So that was sort of why we started that way. Uh, another reason is that uh, I had become very interested in working with horses. And the old horse-drawn equipment we started out with, which were row crop corn cultivators, about as close as you could go was 36 inches apart, so we just started with that. There was really no horse-drawn equipment set up for multiple row beds at the time. It would be easy enough to do, but we didn't have that. And now, hundreds, if not thousands of acres of Amish farms are putting out black plastic to develop horse-drawn plastic mulch layers, but no one even thought of that in the early 80s. That's a relatively new invention. So those are some of the, the reasons why we ended up uh, the way we did, um, sort of in terms of background. The other thing was the goals we set for our farm. And one of the first things we decided is that we wanted to keep our farm a two-person operation. And that was partly to uh, not have to deal with the headaches and expenses of labor, but it's mainly because the two of us just really love to work together. This is more of a quality of life goal than a rigorous business decision. Well, if it's going to be a two-person operation, that sort of excludes higher labor for we need our harvesting. It was another goal was to stay out of debt. So we weren't inclined to go out and buy some high-tech cultivating equipment right off the bat. In fact, you'll see in the slides we do almost all of our work with a old horse-drawn riding cultivator that cost us $35. Very <laughs> low-budget start for our farm. <coughs> we also thought it would be a good idea to rely on the internal resources of our farm as much as possible, rather than depending on a lot of off-farm inputs. So that goal kind of precluded buying in a lot of plastic mulch or other inputs of the wheat control. Well, if you take away labor, take away sophisticated cultivating equipment, take away plastic mulch, what's left to deal with the wheat? Well, <laughs> and that's still labor. <laughs> um, what we see are, is actually quite a bit is left, and that is cultural practices. By cultural practices, we're talking about cover cropping, composting, bare fallow periods, tillage, and rotation. And for us, rotation is a real biggie because as we see it, rotation is what organizes all of the other cultural practices to achieve a specific goal. So like our goal is low wind pressure and building up the soil, we can use rotation to put together the other cultural practices to achieve that goal. As I said, there really weren't any vegetable rotations out there to learn that. Time. Most rotations were based on moving plant families around so you didn't get the buildup of diseases. You know, you aren't going to plant potatoes after tomatoes, something like that. So what we did is we started uh, asking the second and third generation dairy farmers in our area, how did you farm before they were chemical herbicides? How did you control the weeds? How did you keep the fertility up before there were fertilizers? How did you get all the work done before there were tractors? And inevitably, they always came back to what they called the cow's rotation. This rotation of the different planting windows also creates a, a tillage rotation. And then we have, in the second year, we have tillage late spring for the corn. We have tillage early spring before the oats and we have tillage late summer before the winter wheat. Okay, so we're hitting different types of weeds at different points in their life cycle. Very different than always tilling in May, every year, you know, year after year. Um, and a, a special feature of this rotation is that between the oats, which in our area would be harvested late July, and the wheat planted, say, end of September, is what was called a summer fallow. This is a fairly long period of tillage. And this was excellent for cleaning up perennial weeds. 
big one in our area is quiet grass, other areas, maybe Johnson grass, or Canadian thistle, or something else. But uh, that's sort of a time to address those weeds before it goes into soil. This rotation in our area is actually a, a subsistence farming rotation. We had very small farms. They were not commercial farms. People took the wheat to the mill to get ground for their bread. They had a very small herd of cows. We took butter to town, eggs to town. And, and then actually most of the income was feeding a team of horses, which they used in the winter in the big logging crews in the woods. This changed in the uh, 1940s and 50s uh, when they started adding different cash crops to the location. During uh, World War II, uh, there was a demand for potatoes. And uh, potatoes kind of took the place of corn. Okay? It's a cultivated row crop, it's a heavy feeding crop. It's planted maybe, could be earlier than the corn or later, but it's pretty much that same growing window. Intentionally germinate weeds to grow and then kill them. You might think that's a little odd. Why do we want to grow the weeds? Well, if you can do it at a time of year when you're not growing the vegetables, it's a great strategy. Let's get them up and out of the soil. We can slowly deplete the weed seed bank. And one of the um, things, well, I should say that this is actually very similar to a stale seed bed technique. Some of you might do this where you cultivate the soil a few weeks before you plant, and then you let the weeds sprout, and then you lightly cultivate or you flame them, and then you plant right away. And that typically would be done in the spring before you plant your vegetables. And the two drawbacks with that is one, sometimes the weather doesn't cooperate. It's wet all spring. <laughs> and the other is some weeds don't germinate until later in the summer. They need warmer temperatures or more nitrogen in the soil. And so you, you can't flush them before you plant them. Using this bare fallow period the year before, we can place that bare fallow period to match the most competitive weeds. See how much uh, coverage we get in top growth, even before the leaves, the fully turned color. And the interesting thing, at this time of year, when it's planted that early, the rind bench is like an iceberg. I mean, the root system underground is three or four times more than what we see above ground. This is a totally different scenario than just trying to slip in a cover crop after the harvest of vegetables. The other advantage of this planting date is that most remaining weed seeds that germinate with the cover crop are likely to frost kill before they set viable seed. So by planting the rye and vetch in the second week of August, we can maximize its soil building potential without compromising weed control. And here you can see an overview of one of our late planted vegetables. After the first time through this bioextensive rotation, weed pressures drop to manageable levels. The second time through this four-year cycle, it dropped to minimal levels. And by the third time through the cycle, we virtually eliminated the absence of any drip tape. I was just wondering what were the factors that prevented you from having irrigation? Well, I don't know if you noticed when we the overview of the farm on free land and production is up on top of a hill and our water source is down at the bottom it's a spring and i think it's probably our personalities is that we're just minimalists you know of having to either drill a well or figure out a way to pump it up and things like that so we just have been trying to kind of work with our surroundings so that we don't need irrigation that's why we're doing all the mulch and the mulch tillage we're trying to preserve soil moisture so for 27 years, we haven't had to have drip tape. Some of the, our neighbors, and the neighboring dairy farmers, uh, when we get a droughty year, their wells start going dry. And so we kind of question whether it would be worth drilling a well. We might get lucky, but if, if their cows are drinking their well dry, our vegetables will probably do it even faster. I think you also have to remember that we're in a really cool climate as compared to Virginia. 
Um, our elevation is about 15 to 1600 feet, and it always cools off at night. So we always have a dew. And, you know, we only have a week or so that the weather is really hot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we definitely had years when we wish we could turn on the spigots, but. Um. So it's not something we're, we're sort of advocating, but uh, it's made us better managers of the soil because really preserving soil moisture is what drives the whole farm. That's our limiting nutrient. And this afternoon, we'll look at a lot of the reduced tillage techniques to use to preserve soil moisture. Because there's, it's not just a question of holding enough moisture, it's keeping it close enough to the surface that you can germinate salad mix and carrots. Transplant lettuce every week in the growing season. It's a whole different deal than holding it six inches under. You know. <laughs> question over here. Uh, two questions about keeping resources on your farm. Are you growing your animal feed 